Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited about this session. I'm Laura Williams. I'm happy to be moderating this discussion today and, and really happy that um, you joined us to talk about planning for the long-term future of our children with uh, GRIN or GRIE disorders. Um, I'm joined by Steve and Susan, and I have to tell you, you're in for a treat. Um, it, just in our planning sessions, I learned so much from both of these amazing parents. Um, new ideas, new excitement, new thoughts. Um, it's a topic that I know worries all of us um, in our lives, might keep us up at night as to how, you know, how we're going to keep our kids safe, what are the things we need to do to plan for their future, um, and when do we start doing that? So we're going to unpack some of these things and talk about, you know, from bricks and mortar, what should that look like, to who our, our kids are, and what are the environments that we want to create for them, not just for their safety, but so that they have you know, happy, fulfilled lives. And um, what you'll find is that each of us actually have different um, experiences and, and children with very different needs as all of you will as well. So um, why don't we get started today, Steve, if you wanted to, uh, Steve is graciously offering to screen share for us today because he's better on the tech. Um, and uh, why don't we get, <laughs> and why don't we get started with some introductions? All right, so next slide. There we go. Okay. There we go. So good afternoon or good morning. I'm not sure of the time zones here. Uh, I'm Steve Schock and I'm Dana's dad. And this is Dana. And uh, uh, Dana is 31 years old now and she has got Grin 1. And we really only discovered she had Grin 1 couple of years ago. She was around 28 and a half when uh, we finally did uh, yet another uh, genetic testing and it got mapped out. So uh, uh, we've, we had an, one answer fulfilled uh, at that point in time. So Dana is uh, uh, the oldest of three of our kids. Uh, our other two are, are younger boys and, and they're perfectly normal. Uh, in the upper right there, that's my wife, Linda. Uh, if you're active on the Grin Group, uh, you've probably seen her name. She's a lot more active than I am. Um, but uh, uh, this is uh, us here. And actually, we're, we're down at Ocean City, New Jersey right now, uh, which she loves the beach. Um, she is nonverbal. Uh, so uh, her, her uh, uh, developmental I issues are, are quite severe and profound. Uh, so she needs full-time care. Uh, and that goes into uh, some of the things we'll be talking about today in terms of the uh, the long term planning and the residential side of things, uh, because, as we know, the, the behaviors and abilities are all across the spectrum. Uh, somebody like Dana uh, ultimately needs 24 seven care, uh, somebody to, 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 to help her eat, to dress her, bathe her, change diapers and stay within arm's reach because she can have a seizure and, and fall pretty much at any time. Uh, so that's a little bit about uh, uh, me and, uh, and my grin one. Excellent. Thank you, Susan. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Susan Vertulo, and this is my son, Justin, on the screen. Um, Justin is 23 years old. He has grin 2A. And we also didn't discover that until he was, I think, uh, 20. Um, and uh, that's when we finally had the genetic exome testing done. Um, Justin is, um, if you look at the grand scheme of things, he's relatively high functioning. Um, he uh, now lives in a supported living environment. He has a roommate and that's the cats at my house. He doesn't have the cat with him. But uh, he does have a roommate and they have 24-hour um, staff available. And um, Justin is, uh, he, he's, his functioning is, it's pretty good. Um, he works part-time, um, he can take care of himself and uh, his needs are vastly different than many. Excellent, thank you. And remind me of his cat's, the cat's name. <laughs> The cat is Katmandu. Katmandu, <laughs> that's right. Sorry. 
Love it. Um, thank you both. And what, what Steve didn't tell you is that he is an architect and we're gonna get some great info from him soon. And Susan is a uh, retired OT. So, you know, lots of experience on this, both from a, pers a personal and a, a professional level. Um, so this is Bryson. Uh, I am Bryson's mom and he's 15 years old. Um, this was taken a couple years ago and um, because of COVID that wheelchair now looks like a mini chair on him and we're desperate to get him a new one as soon as possible. Um, and on the next slide, you'll see a little bit about our family. So um, those are a bit blurry, sorry, but um, and a bit dated as well, but um, Bryson has grin one. He requires help for all activities of daily living. He has both physical and developmental disabilities, um, potentially seizures, um, also lots of behavior stuff that happens. Um, so lots of safety and environment issues that are required for his kind of long-term planning and his future. Um, and uh, Keith is, is uh, my husband and Bry's dad. Um, so if you've seen or heard the podcast, um, you'll have heard me talk in, I think, the last episode just about, you know, planning for Bryson's future. And, and I have a good friend, um, Becky and her son, Jack. You know, we've already started talking or we started talking a couple of years ago about, um, you know, what does it look like for both of our kids together and their futures and planning. But I'll have to say it's been a very daunting thing for us to consider. But even in just the short discussions I had with Steve and Susan on planning for this, it actually kind of broke it down a little bit more for me, it made some new questions arise where it feels a little less daunting and uh, most days I wanna bury my head in the sand, but but maybe uh, we're ready to take that that next step forward to, to doing some of this planning. So um, thank you so much for um, being here. And I'll also share that I'm Laura Williams and the tireless, amazing Lauren Williams is also part of this group and on the board and we sometimes get confused and anytime I'm mixed up with Lauren, it's uh, I'm grateful and honored. So <laughs> I just thought I would share that because um, it happens from time to time. So let's, uh, without ado, get into the the meat and potatoes of this discussion. Steve, over okay. to you. Okay. So as Laura said, uh, I am an architect, and uh, uh, one of the things in my professional career and practice, uh, the, you know, very early on. Uh, I do a lot of residential design, uh, multifamily residential. Uh, and this is one of those great intersections of my personal life and my professional life uh, because I really developed a, a, quite a specialty in supportive housing, which is housing for multiple populations that have special needs and considerations. Uh, and certainly our kids all fall into that. Uh, it's a general term. Um, and when we're talking about housing and residential, uh, you really have to realize that there's there's no such real thing as housing for grin kids. <laughs> you know that it's really housing for people that have a need for certain supports in their residential placement so that they can live a full life and thrive and be healthy and, and safe in their in their residential environment. Uh, so that's my profession uh, as an architect. Uh, I'm also a board member of a group called SHA, uh, or the Supportive Housing Association in New Jersey. Uh, that's that's where I'm from. And uh, that's something that probably exists in many other states. Uh, and there's also a national organization called the Corporation for Supportive Housing. Look, I know that all, uh, I get confused with all of the, the acronyms and all the jargon that goes with some of the sessions I've already heard today. Well, the problem that you're going to face is ultimately when you get to housing, there's a whole new set of acronyms and jargon that you're going to have to learn uh, because it's not the medical side. It's it's really the uh, uh, services side of things. Uh, so uh, one thing I want to ask uh, to start out with really is when you think about where your child's going to be, where, where they're going to live after they're out of your home, what image comes to mind? For a long time, for many people, it's a, a very institutional kind of image, especially for those like, like Dana who are uh, lower functioning. Uh, there's There have historically have been very few options. Uh, if not an institution, perhaps it, it might be something like a group home. Uh, and a group home is a fine, uh, fine option for, for some folks. Uh, and I know that they get a little bit of a bad rap sometimes because you hear some, some negative stuff on, on the news. Uh, but for everyone that you hear like that, that, there are literally thousands of group homes that people really are thriving in. But other than those two, 
most folks that I talk to really don't know what else is, is out there. Um, so the, the fact of the matter is uh, supportive housing can come in every shape and size and, and, and flavor that, that, that you can think of. Uh, every one of these buildings and, and projects that you're seeing here uh, have integrated into them supportive housing. And all that really means, frankly, the housing is the easy part. It's the sticks and the bricks. What it means is the folks that are, that are living there have additional levels of support that are customized and, and brought in place so that uh, people other than mom and dad can care for them, make sure that they get their meds, can make sure that their 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 clothes and, and linens are clean, uh, make sure that they get, get fed and, and all of those things. For those who are higher functioning, it, it may be making sure that they get uh, up on time for their job and things of that nature. Um, but if you've got a preconception of what your future home is going to look like or where it's going to be, one of the good takeaways is it really can look like anything. Even the high rise on, on the right hand side, there are literally four group home apartments in that building that have wonderful views of Manhattan. That's actually in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Um, so there, there are 16 individuals with developmental disabilities that live in that building. And to my understanding, some of the parents actually rented market rate apartments on other floors in that same building. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to assume that you're going to be going uh, and looking only at a shared residence. Now, shared residences are one type uh, of housing. Uh, wanted to, to give you a little bit on, on the Supportive Housing Association, which is a member group. Uh, folks like myself, there are support providers, uh, agencies that staff and provide support in residential placements for people that, that have uh, these kinds of needs. Uh, there are government entities. Uh, in New Jersey, you've got the uh, Department of Community Affairs and the Housing Mortgage Finance Agency and others that are also members. This is a group that focuses on creating more housing opportunities and also driving the advocacy for more community-based living um, so that uh, with with many of our states here in the, in the United States, there, there is a Supreme Court decision called the Olmstead decision, which basically says that people with disabilities need to be offered or, or able to live in the least restrictive setting possible in the community, and as opposed to being isolated away in institutions. That's a huge political shift from over the last last uh, two decades, and. Organizations like SHA or the Corporation for Supportive Housing advocate for those kinds of policy changes. One thing that, that I'd like you to note is in the lower right hand corner, uh, there is a free download of this housing guide. And, and this is the, we, we produced this with a grant and it goes through in generic terms. Yes, there's some New Jersey specific language in there about funding programs, but it really goes through in generic terms, a lot of the options going through supported living, shared living, uh, group homes. Many folks, even folks like Dana, who literally can't speak, can have their own apartment in a market rate apartment building and surround themselves with enough robust uh, um, services in order to live. Uh, so those kinds of options really were not available before. Um, so one of the things that, that you're going to need, uh, I know it's been said a number of times in the conference today, starting early. And just when you think you're, 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 you're figuring out Medicare and Medicaid and, and, and services and the schools and things like that, housing is a completely different thing. Um, all of your support dollars for uh, whatever, whatever uh, agency is helping pay for, for the staffing, they will not pay for housing. So you need to to start thinking about the world of affordable housing uh, and, and rental programs. You know, for example, that the housing, the, very often people will get a housing voucher and that's to pay for the rent. You know, if, if you have only say six, $700 coming in in a month from social security, a third of that is gonna go to the rent and that voucher will pay for the rest of it. And, and so that's a big piece. Now that won't pay to, 
bring somebody in and help, but it'll pay for the housing. So this is a very big high level thing, uh, discussion about really understanding some of the other world that you're gonna have to start getting getting used to. And this this resource is a wonderful book. Like I said, it's a, it's a free download and it really walks you through all of the different kinds of housing and what kind of choices you have because you really do have a great many choices. So I've Last just, um, just for those of you, I posted the link to that in the chat there as well. And, you know, it sounds like a great um, guide to start looking and thinking and problem solving. And then also to look locally as to, you know, what are the supporting how supportive housing associations that are um, local to you and the legislation. So there, it's a lot to wade through, as you mentioned, Steve, and lots of new language to learn. So this might be a good, a good place to start. Yeah, and in in our house, it's kind of we're 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 blessed because I handle this side of that language. Linda tends to handle more of the the, the language of uh, of the medical side of things and and the Medicare Medicaid stuff. So uh, you know, my 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 hats are off to any of you single parents out there, and I know there are a lot of you. Uh, I honestly don't know how a single person does it because it, it's hard on us with with, with two. So the last thing that I want to, to share with you is something I'm kind of excited about, which is there's as an architect, there's always something going on. Uh, this is a, a actually a, a new community that I'm working on currently. This is on on the boards. It's called Circle Haven, and uh, it's unique in that in that it's in New Jersey. We really are not typically allowed to create communities where 100% of the residents are all special needs or disabled. Uh, they, the state of New Jersey considers that uh, a violation of the Olmstead decision. But some small, uh, in certain locations, we're, we're starting to be able to do these kinds of things, which are demonstration projects. This is a, a, an intentional community. Only 24 adults will, will live here. And these are all cottages. Uh, the plan in the lower right sh it gives you a sense because that's half of one of the cottages. Uh, so each resident is going to have their own two room suite, basically a sleeping area and their own private living area. Uh, and then there's a shared living space where just those two residents will share that living room, dining space, kitchen, where they can get some hand over hand assistance uh, or staff can help and simply do the cooking for them. In the middle of, of that plan is a staff space so that like overnight, they can monitor the doors and, and make sure that there's there's plenty of uh, uh, oversight for the two residents. So really, four individuals will share an entire house. And then those houses are clustered and linked together so that uh, uh, it's a secure courtyard environment. Everything's uh, the no-step barrier-free. Uh, there, there's gardening and greenhouses. It, it's... It's a really wonderful uh, concept that this particular nonprofit is putting out there. Uh, and I see this as being the next level here in New Jersey. I know there are some demonstrations like this around the country, uh, but in the Mid-Atlantic, we haven't really seen much like this before. Uh, so it's something that uh, is current and I'm excited about. So I'm going to pass it over right now to Susan. Um Actually, I just wondered, sorry, Susan, to, to pause for one second, but we, we had a conversation in our planning, um, Susan and Steve, about, you know, the bricks and mortar and some of the technical pieces. So when we were thinking about our kids and just who they are, um, you know, what are some of the, the considerations? So Steve, you had mentioned sharp edges being something, also the northern facing, and like just even where you pick and plan what are the triggers for your kids? What do they particularly like? Um, do they create a lot of noise? I know Bryson, oh my goodness, if we put him, you know, anytime we go on holidays, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, somebody beside us is gonna have a really wonder what's happening in the yeah. room next door to them. So yeah, just wondered yeah. if both Unfortunately, I, what I don't get to do, I don't usually get to meet who I'm designing for uh, because I do multifamily housing for agencies that, uh, that will then put it out and, and bring people in. What I do get to understand is, in general, what level of need uh, somebody's going to have. Uh, so you mentioned a couple things. Uh, we have to pay attention to glare, uh, and that can be done with, with control devices, or it can be done by orienting windows and such to northern, uh, northern uh, exposures so that there's less uh, direct sunlight. 
every site has some traffic noise or airplane noise or other kinds of noise. Noise is a big trigger uh, and uh, trying to manage that and uh, in new construction especially, you can put a lot of things under the, uh, under the skin of a building that can help dampen noise. In those apartment buildings where you've got people on top of each other, there's no guarantee that the people above or below you or even next door are going to have a disability or even understand the, the, the behaviors that come with yours. So if you're on an upper floor and you don't understand that stomping around at three o'clock in the morning might be disturbing somebody, that's, that's a concern. So uh, a lot of these things we need to take into a, a, a account when we're selecting where we're gonna be. In that same building, for example, taking a ground floor unit that is on the concrete slab, uh, or an end unit that doesn't have as many party walls and shared walls. That's something that's going to basically help you and 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 your child not be disturbed, but also not have your, your child disturb somebody else. Uh, so th there's a lot of those kinds of things. Sharp edges is a big one. Dana falls and has seizures uh, all the time. Uh, so we look to, to make sure that we don't have like closets that jut out and create sharp corners. Uh, furniture is all well padded. There's no uh, footboards on beds and things like that. Uh, it, it really gets down to the details because at the end of the day, nobody is more of an expert than mom and dad uh, on, on what those triggers are and what those danger points are in the, in the physical environment. Awesome. Susan, any comments on that? Um, basically, yeah, my son lives in an apartment um, and the apartment was, it's a condo. It's a, it, they're, um, like garden apartment condos and it is owned by the city where we live and they uh, built it before they bought it and they did buy you know ground floor and all that for for the clients that they have um, but one of the things they didn't do was take into consideration about the soundproofing and Justin's roommate happens to be totally deaf and he's very loud <laughs> sometimes when he gets excited he whoops and hollers and and he doesn't understand that so that has been a bit of a problem and um you know uh i know the staff where where they live will advocate for them quite a bit and saying you know come and meet the the guys and mm -hmm. you know and you'll see that you know craig is fine he's he's yelling but he's fine yeah. um you know things like that so um you know it it really does matter if you can if you can plan ahead and make a list of these things that your child might need. Um, it's always good to you know to be more prepared than less prepared. Um, you know that's that's where I would start. Well, and I love what you just said about the community, right? So bringing in meeting each other that you know if our kids are going to be in a space, knowing who's around them and them knowing who our children are. So thank you for that. Turning it over to you now to, um, okay. to talk about your your background and experience and thoughts. Okay. Um, as as w was mentioned earlier, I am a retired pediatric occupational therapist, and I contracted for, to early intervention in the city in which I lived, and I got to know a lot of people in different departments of, of in the city dealing with you know individuals with disabilities, and that has been invaluable in my search um and you know one of the first questions that comes up is when should i start to plan for the future um our situation was a little bit different because we didn't realize justin had any type of disability until um he was around 10 years old he had some trouble with speech and language and motor coordination but even as an ot i didn't think it was anything worse than developmental but then he started having seizures and, you know, he, he gradually went downhill and, um, I, but when he, about midway through high school, I realized, you know, he's not going to be going to college. He's not going to be, um, independent someday. So I started planning. Um, he was 17 when I started, you know, doing actual, um, applications and things like that. Um, and uh, I, I can tell you that um, th this is not an easy process. And I like to tell people that I 
uncovered a wealth of misinformation along the way, meaning that um, you have to double check everything um, just because somebody says, oh, this is how it is. Or, and I'm, I mean, people that are official, try to get things in writing, um, you know, friends and, you know, neighbors and all that will try to be helpful. And of course you can't take everything they say as fact. And even doctors that I've talked with have thought that, you know, this is how you apply for Medicaid or whatever. And you really have to go straight to the source. That's one of the things that, that I can't emphasize enough um, to avoid, you know, running into lots of misinformation. Um, okay, so um, I, I suggest that between your um, child's 17th and 18th birthday, they're likely going to still be in some sort of a school program and you wanna get a neuropsych eval. This is very important. Um, I, there's, you need it in order to get Social Security and Medicaid in the United States. I really don't know um, what it would be like in other countries, even Canada, I don't know. But I do know that it's a little bit different. But I still think that you know the time to start planning is earlier rather than later. Um, and one of the things that we had to go back and make sure was in Justin's record was a diagnosis of a global developmental delay. And that was much easier to do once we got the genetic exome testing because GRIN 2A qualifies as a global developmental delay. Um, and uh, you have to go to your local um, organizations and you know start start with your city and find out what sort of services are available. Um, I would look online before you make phone calls and take notes on all the calls. Um, I, it's been suggested to me to have a notebook. Um, I have loose leaf papers that are, you know, in a file this thick <laughs> um, just for housing uh, that I've collected over the years. Um, you definitely want to find out about the medical funding and medical services that are available um, as your child approaches adulthood. Um, there's, if your child doesn't already have Medicaid, a lot of these kids that already have a diagnosis of GRIN 2A will maybe already be on Medicaid. Um, or if they're on your health insurance, you still want to start that process and be ready to apply the day your child turns 18. Um, reason being that they will consider your income. Um, my income was too high to, uh, to get Medicaid for Justin until he turned 18, and then they considered his income. So that's the day I applied. I had the application ready to go. Um, and uh, the earlier you start, the better. The more you know, the better. Can't emphasize that enough. Um, and then, oh, okay. So let's say you apply for uh, Medicaid or um, a housing waiver. Justin's housing, he's in a supported living. Um, if you think back to Steve's list, um, supported living, um, that's a special Medicaid waiver in my state. It's called the FIS waiver, which is family and individual supports. Um, basically what that means is that support services can come into your home or they can come into the home that um, they, they have the Medicaid waivers providing the, uh, the extra income. They, you know, Justin, someone, I think Laura, you mentioned about the uh, one third of the income that they, that they get from Social Security or if they have a part-time job. Justin has Social Security and a part-time job with a job coach. So one, th one third of that goes to his housing and the rest is used for whatever else he might need. Um, but you, know, you, you, want, you definitely want to um, find out if you, if you apply for housing waiver, if you apply for Medicaid, if you apply for Social Security and you get turned down, you want to ask for a detailed explanation. Take notes, try to get as much as you can in writing from them. And also, just as a tip, when you're, when you're applying for any of these services, always think of what is your child's worst case scenario. Um, 
don't don't think about okay well you know he's not that bad most of the time but you know are there times that he's destructive or she's destructive are there times that um the they're not safe um to be you know let like you can't leave some people alone i, I imagine you can't leave dana alone um not at all. yeah um justin can be left alone but you know he 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 needs to be checked in on quite a bit um but you know that's you always want to think about the worst case scenario and don't be too optimistic about it because they have to meet certain qualifications and there is a, a very detailed point system that they use so you want to make sure that they get as many points towards um needing services while still being honest of course um because you don't want them to qualify for something that they really don't need um that that can also work against you because if they put them in um you know uh uh like a an adult um disabilities nursing home type setting and all they really need is supported living that's not going to be helpful so you want to be honest but think of the worst possible day of your kid's life <laughs> yes, so, so, susan let me just add it in for a minute that's such a hard thing for most parents to do because yeah. We want to celebrate. We want to cheer on uh, our, our kids for every little accomplishment. And we don't want to define them by their worst moments. No. But you have to understand that's the way the game is played. Right. And, and the, the, if you're advocating for your kids, you need to, to put that, that cheerleader role aside and really understand that, that you have to look very dispassionately and very uh, – uh, almost pessimistically. It's yeah. a hard thing for parents to do, but it really, it's part of what we need to learn for advocacy. And that that's not just in, uh, during school and IEPs and all of that, but also in the, in the adult service world. Yes. Well, and, and so often the needs of our kids far outweigh what is available to us to support them um, financially or with actual resources. So yes, I agree. Um, hard to do, but really important. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, if you if you feel like you're just, you can't deal with it and you need help, there are organizations. Um, I know on Facebook, there's a local one here in Virginia called um, Moms in Motion and they help people. Um, it's just a group of mothers that um, get together and help people. Um, and, you know, and always go to somebody that already maybe is in this situation and say, hey, I've got to fill out this application. I'm not sure how to fill out some of these pieces of it. Ask them. And of course, um, one of the things that I did was I went to the social security office and I had them sit down with me. I had um, a blank form already filled out in pencil and where I wasn't sure what to put, I asked for help and I brought Justin along with me. And although he's verbal friendly and all that, he soon lost interest and fell asleep and was snoring and that, that <laughs> demonstrated that they needed to make me his um, rep payee because he just wasn't at all interested in this. And this was his future, you know? Um, so that's, it's helpful if you bring your child along, um, at least for part of that process. If you have someone else, you can take your child away if they get antsy or loud or whatever, um, give them a few minutes to see your child in action. That's very helpful. It's a great um, point, right? Often we want to separate them from these processes, but it has to be real for those who are making the decisions. Yes. Um, and I want to quickly add um, in terms of um, competency. Um, I ended up having um, to go to court to have Justin declared incompetent um, because he's high functioning, but he's just high functioning enough to get himself in trouble and not know how to get out of it. Um, he's very gullible. Everyone's his friend. Um, you know, uh, homeless people would come up to him and ask him for money and he'd give them whatever money he had. So I got him a cash app card and, um, I can't stop him from going and buying a pack of cigarettes for someone that's homeless, but I do tell him, well, you know, he has to contact me to use the card and I put the money on for him. So, 
you know, if I say to him, well, if you're going to buy cigarettes for the homeless guy, why don't you buy a pack for yourself and just give him a cigarette, you know, and that way I'm sort of helping him with the problem solving and he's learning some consequences, hopefully. Um, but, um, you know, he's also able to participate in his own decision making that way. Um, this was not something that was sanctioned by the commissioner of courts, but it's something that I started doing and told them I was going to do, and they haven't done anything to me yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I think they're, uh, cause I, Justin, I should back up a little bit. Um, when I had Justin declared incompetent, he was, um, he, he was living with me and I was granted full conservatorship which at the time I thought was, oh, this is great. I'm in charge of everything. I can protect him. Well, when he moved out, I realized just how hard it was going to be to save all the receipts that I needed to, to save and, and make this report every year. And I'll tell you, I came very close to a nervous breakdown this year. He's been living outside of my home uh, one year now. And when I wrote the last report up, it took me months. And many trips and conversations with the commissioner's office and they're actually very supportive um and reasonable but um i would say save yourself the heartache if if your state works the same way as virginia and they offer you partial conservatorship take it don't take the full if you can avoid it just you know that's just my own experiences um and then sorry like can i just jump in really quick susan just on the piece around guardianship so um kind of regardless of where your child is at and this was something we learned um we're in canada and you know we had we will have to apply for guardianship and go to the consent and capacity board here to get that for bryson even though his disabilities like he's nonverbal, you know has a, a psychological evaluation that puts him at you know um a kind of one-year-old level, um, but it's still a process that we actually have to go through. And Steve, I know you mentioned that as well. Yeah, so we, we had to go through the yeah. same thing. Uh, it's yeah. actually a pretty funny story when you think about how they need to talk to your child without you in the room to make sure that you're not influencing their decisions. Uh, Dana <laughs> spent maybe 30 seconds in the lawyer's office before he was begging us to come back in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it's, you know, with a higher functioning kid, it's, it's a little different, but, um, you know, it's, it still drove the point home, having the lawyer talk to Justin and seeing that even though he's verbal and charming and all that, um, yeah, he, his decision-making is, you know, out the window. Um, but, uh, let's see here, um, back to the slide, um, finding out what options are avail available to you. It's really important to familiarize yourself with what is available in your city, in your state. Um, go online and, you know, just Google, um, you know, uh, where do developmentally disabled adults live in, you know, what type of housing is available for them in your state. Um, and same thing um, with funding, um, you know, that's um, Justin got the FIS waiver and he could have gotten a couple of other waivers, but they would have meant that he had to live in a group home. And for Justin, a group home was not the best option. Um, he's verbal, he's stubborn, he gets into arguments, <laughs> whereas he gets along great with the one roommate and having the staff there pretty much 24 hours a day available to him is huge because if he needs help, if he's trying to cook something, um, he's not allowed to use the stove independently, but you know, um, he's got somebody there to help him and, but he still has his independence. Um, so you have to know your kid, you have to know what their needs are and you have to try to anticipate as best you can, what their needs might be in a few years. Um, and, you know, look at what's available and see what's the best fit for you. Um, also, another thing, um, consider the location of your housing options. There was a brand new, uh, bigger apartment complex that was opened up um, just before I chose the housing that, that Justin's in now. Um, it was closer to me, but there were no stores nearby, and he, he can walk to the store. Um, where he lives now, he just cuts across the yard 
and he is in a um, a small shopping center with Dunkin' Donuts and 7-Eleven mm -hmm. and two grocery stores and a pizza place. And he can walk to all these places and get what he needs. And he has his phone with me. He can call me. He can call the staff. It's It's a perfect setup for him. And it's also reasonably close to where I live. He can't walk to my house, which is probably good, <laughs> but, um, but uh, he, 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 can, he can call me and I can be there in 15 minutes if need be. Um, so I'm, so I'm seeing that hard. we're, I'm sorry to interrupt. I see that we're out of time on our session. Oh, I wasn't sure if it was actually just gonna cut us right off. I don't think it has, which is great. Um, so uh, we will look to close off in, in one minute. And Steve, I just interrupted you though. Do you wanna? No, I, I, was, I was simply going to add one other thing about location uh, because uh, in most places, whether it's in the United States or abroad, uh, the funding sources are very localized. Uh, one of the things that, that you have to understand is if you're gonna move and cross a county line or a state line, your funding situation might change. Wind up having to start all over again. It took us 15 to, to 18 years before Dana went on the list to the point where she was allocated a, a, a community care waiver, which pays for a lot of her services. If we were to retire and move to Florida, she would start again. So Dana's never leaving. <laughs> so that 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 really will ultimately be a consideration of, of uh, where you as parents are gonna gonna wind up being, as well as where your kids are. Yeah, really important. Those wait lists can be long and oh, yeah, and yeah. some, but some are better um, and some uh, than others. So I'm seeing some thank yous here. There were a couple questions, sorry that we didn't get to them, but we'll follow up um, if we have some answers and email those who, who put those questions in, just two, I think. Um, so thank you, Steve and Susan. We really appreciate your insight, your wisdom, your openness, um, and that you took the time to help us walk through this really important dialogue that I hope continues. So lots of fun. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye, Thanks. everyone. Thank you for joining us.